Open your book, please, to the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, page 1349 in your Schofield Bible. We'll be reading the first nine verses responsively. And I have yet another verse I'll be turning to, and which I'll read for you after we read these verses. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 9, page 1349. And let's stand as is our custom for the reading of the Word of God. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And let's read the ninth together. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. Now I'm reading this verse for you. The first chapter of the sixth chapter, the first verse of the sixth chapter of Amos. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Let's pray. Father, unique is our opportunity in all the world. There's no church like this church. Father, this is further enhanced by the fact that there are no people like the people assembled here, the greatest folks on earth, and to further, of course, make the matter more blessed than any place anybody could go is that we have a wonderful man of God, thy man who preaches faithfully, and we thank you for our preacher. And we pray that you're blessed now in this service. We know that you have something special to do in the hearts of the listeners. We pray that you give us the heart to listen and our minds may they be alert. We pray for our preacher and, of course, in the usual and wonderful way, empower him for the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can come up with more good songs that I never heard before. I don't know where he gets them, but but every time John, almost every time he sings, he has a song I've never heard, but it's a song that I wish I'd written. And uh, I want to talk tonight on the subject, if it's not broken, broken <coughs> pardon me, if it's not broken, fix it. I'm going to make a statement, and we're going to pray, and then I'm going to bring the message. I don't know if I've ever thought through this, and I, I'm not saying that this is Bible, what I'm saying now. It's what I've noticed in my own life, in my own ministry. It's what I've noticed. And that is this. The people in the most danger of falling are usually the people who've risen the highest. Um, I hope I can make this plain before I start. The, the Christian who is nominal, who just comes on Sunday morning 
maybe just comes on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and, and doesn't get involved a great deal. Very few of those fall. Isn't that amazing? Percentage-wise, you'll find a lot more people fall. And by fall, I mean become useless, drop out of the Lord's work totally. I don't I'm talking about committing any particular sin, but become useless to the work of God. Quit church totally. I'll bind you that more fervent Christians have, have fallen from being useful to God than the nominal Christians. I'm talking about uh, the people who come but are not active in the work of the Lord. I'm speaking tonight on the subject, if it's not broken, fix it. Our Heavenly Father, I really believe what I'm going to say tonight is helpful and will be helpful. So I do pray that you'd give me the attention of the people tonight in a very special way. Bless me as I speak. Those who hear, bless us together as pastor and people. Amen. Did it ever dawn on you where the first sin was committed? The first sin ever committed was committed in heaven. No temptation there. Ideal situation. The first sin ever committed was committed in heaven. But that isn't all. Do you know who it was who committed the first sin? It was an angel. But that isn't all. Do you know who committed the first sin? One of the three top angels. But that isn't all. Do you know who committed the first sin? The top personality, the deputy, the right-hand deputy to God himself, was the one who committed the first sin. Now look at the circumstances when the first sin was committed. There were no dirty magazines to stand between him and the candy counter. There were no flashing lights luring him to a dirty movie. It was perfect, a perfect, as it were, as it could be, situation. There, were no, there was no wrong crowd to lead Lucifer astray. There was no atheistic professor to ruin his mind and to shake his faith in the Word of God. There were no fallen women to lead him to lust. There were no slum areas to encourage his fall. There was no ghetto to push him to dope. There was no adult bookstore with its serpentine atmosphere. There was no profanity to corrupt his ears. There was no television to pipe fornication into his living room. There were no bars with alcohol to dull his mind. There was no rock music to shatter his nervous system. There was no Playboy magazine to stir his passions. There was no immodest clothing in disobedience to the Word of God. There were no discos, no dope pushers, no pimps, no liberals, no beer, no nightclubs, no perverted translations of the Bible, no devil to tempt, no flesh to be tempted, no world to entice. Angels sang the praises of God all the time and ministered to God day and night. Don't forget what I'm saying. It was in this atmosphere where the first sin was committed. Did it ever dawn on you where the first man sinned? It was in the Garden of Eden, where innocence ruled, where man fellowship with God every day. There were no thorns, no poisonous reptiles, no prickly weeds, no raging beast, no stormy nights, no dying flower, no sweaty brow. No liberal seminary, no sinful advertisements, no dingy taverns, no shady characters, no rock concerts. 
It was in the atmosphere that I just described where the first man committed his first sin. It never dawn on you when the first child of man, where the first child of man sinned, Cain in the Garden of Eden. It never dawn on you the atmosphere. Both his parents were saved. He was cradled in a lullaby of love and faith. From infancy he worshipped with his parents. Every Sabbath his parents worshipped at the altar of sacrifice. And Cain actually, look at me, listen to me, Cain actually heard the voice of God speak. That isn't all. His parents could actually show him the results of sin. They could point to a rose and say, Cain, see those thorns? There were no thorns there before sin came. They could actually point to a snake crawling on the ground and say, Cain, look at that snake. That was one time the most beautiful of all the creatures. They could point to Cain and show him the results of sin. They could point to a barren tree and say, Cain, at one time that tree was never barren. At one time the leaves were always there, and the fruit came forth all the time. Every season of the year, Cain sin caused that tree to be barren. They could point to a falling petal from a flower and say to Cain, Cain, there was a time when no petals ever fell and no flower ever faded, but sin caused the fading of the flower. What a tremendous, uh, what tremendous illustrations and, and visual aids that they had to teach their son the wages of sin. They could point to a stormy night and say to Cain, there was a day when there were no stormy nights. There was a day when there was no sin. Sin brought those stormy nights. They could point, as it were, to a dead animal and say to Cain, Cain, that too is a result of sin. They could have said, son, don't you sin. Everything you see that has a curse on it, it was caused because of sin. They could say there was a day when the animals did not die, but sin brought the death of those animals. They could point their own wrinkles and say, Cain, these wrinkles were caused by sin. They could point to their own furrowed brows, stooped shoulders, and say, Cain, this also was caused by sin. They could point to the wild beast that was dangerous to man and say, there was a day we could play with that animal. He offered no, no threat whatsoever to us. Uh, he was not wild. He was not dangerous. He was not ferocious. But sin brought that. It was in this atmosphere where the first child of man sinned. Now get this, the first sin ever committed in the glories of the celestial city of heaven, and the first sin committed on earth, committed in the Edenic splendor of the Garden of Eden, like the Millennial Kingdom will someday be, and the first, the first son or child of man sinned in the Garden of Eden, where his mother and father actually heard the voice of God, and no doubt Cain likewise heard the voice of God. Did you know where the last battle on earth will start? After 1,000 years of millennial peace, after 1,000 years of Jesus ruling and reigning on the earth, where men's swords shall be turned into plowshares and their spears and pruning hooks, where men will know war not at all for a thousand long years. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, that's five times the, the, the age of our nation. For 1,000 years, and we read a while ago that at the end of that 1,000 years, from that very millennial paradise and bliss, there shall come forth a, a war between Gog and Magog. Once again, Russia shall rise up, and the land of Russia, and they will try to take over, and Satan will gather an army and fight. So the first sin came from heaven, and the first sin on earth came from the Eden Gardens, Eden, and the, uh, the Garden of Eden, and the first sin of the child of man came in that beautiful, wonderful garden where their parents walked with God and heard God speak, and the last battle shall be fought during the millennial age and shall end the millennial age. I'm saying that it was in the, in, in the midst of these utopias where sin began. For 120 years, Noah preached. 120 years he preached. Over a century, he warned the people of the coming flood. He warned the people, preach righteousness, the Bible says. 
and built the ark. What a wonderful man of faith. And as soon as the, the, the climax of it all came, the flood came, he was saved through the flood by the ark, then it was in that kind of a circumstance that Noah was naked and drunk and seen by his son and maybe uh, even uh, had, was, had the sin of, of homosexuality uh, committed with him. He had just preached the great revival, the greatest revival the world has ever seen in the city of Nineveh. And Jonah, in that influence, with that revival still echoing and those memories still fresh in his mind, it was in that wonderful environment where Jonah backslid and got away from God. He had just seen that they had just seen the Passover. They had just seen the deliverance of God the Israelites had from the land of Egypt. They had just crossed over the Red Sea on dry ground. They had just uh, gotten for the first time manna from heaven every morning to cover the ground like the dew of the, the, of the morning. They had gotten the water from the rock in Horeb. They were led by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They had their clothes not to, I mean, the clothes grew as they grew, and their shoes grew as their feet grew. And these people in this wonderful bliss, with God providing food every day, God providing water every day, God providing leadership every day, they came to a place called Cadius Barnea, and unbelief came in, this, in the midst of these marvelous, wonderful victories. They had just won the battle of Jericho, the Israelites. This great battle where they marched around the city once a day for six days and seven times the seventh day and blew their trumpets and shouted and the walls came tumbling down and the marvelous, amazing, miraculous, supernatural victory was theirs. It was in the aftermath of that very victory that they lost the next battle in Ai. Peter had just been in the upper room. Peter had just heard the Savior say, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And Peter had just a few hours before been in that upper room. And it was, it was the, the time when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He came to Peter, and Peter said, No, you're not going to wash my feet. I, I should wash your feet. It was there in the upper room a few hours before. And now in the aftermath of that blessed time with the Savior, Peter curses, swears, denies he knows the Son of God. Now what am I saying? Listen carefully. It is the best marriage that's in most trouble. I'm coming from the impractical to the practical. It is the best marriage that's in the most trouble. How many ladies have said to me, I'm quoting, I didn't know we were having trouble. You know why? You didn't fix it when it wasn't broken. Just as sin came into heaven and sin came in the Garden of Eden, and sin will come in the millennium. That beautiful, sweet, most loving marriage, in my opinion, and I'm not giving this because of what I think. I'm telling you what I've heard. I promise you this. One year from tonight, there'll be a dozen or more couples in this room who will be separated or divorcing. I promise you this also, that they will not come, most of them, from the average families. They will come from the happiest marriages. I know what I'm talking about. Somebody said, Brother Howes, it just suddenly happened. No, it didn't suddenly happen. Because you weren't trying to fix it all the time. You see, a marriage that's having trouble is trying to fix it all the time. A marriage that's having no trouble, are you listening, is not trying to fix it. Now, you listen to me. I'm not kidding. You folks that are ha very happily married, you think you're living in marital bliss. Dr. Billings used to say, he and his wife had 20 wonderful years, and then they got married. But, but I'm saying this. I'm saying that, that, that the people who have the happiest marriages oftentimes don't try to fix them. They don't all the time, not all the time, on the lookout. So I'm saying, I promise you this, I promise you that one year from tonight, 
most of the marriages that will end in divorce or separation will come from the best marriages in this room tonight. Not only that, it is the best school that is in most trouble. Let me say it again. It is the best school. Hey, listen. You check the history, the last ten years of Christian school history, and you'll find that the mediocre schools are still mediocre. But you'll find the best preacher training schools in America 10, 15, 20 years ago have fallen below the mediocre schools. I dare you to check it out. Check it out. You'll find that the best schools are in the most trouble. You'll find the best church is the church that's in the most trouble. You see, the, the smoothest trip is oftentimes the most dangerous. It's not the fellow who's going around. How long has it been since you heard of a death on Pike's Peak? I was out in Colorado Springs preaching here or so ago, and I took Jack DeCoster out with me. And I said, Jack, let's go up on Pike's Peak. Well, I'd been up there two or three times before, so we took off up Pike's Peak. The guy began to beg for me. He said, Preacher, let's go back. Let's go back. All those horseshoe curves. He, he said, There's no fence there. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing between us and down there but air. He said, Let's go back. I said, Oh, come on, Jack. Be a man, man. Be a man. He took his checkbook and he said, you want another one? I said, I'll go back. <laughs> but you, 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 don't, you hardly ever hear of anybody being killed on Pikes Peak in those winding horseshoe curves. Where are they killed? Interstates. Go to sleep at the wheel because everything is so smooth. And that's the way your home is. You go to sleep at the wheel. You don't take, it's where your marriage is. You go to sleep at the wheel. You don't work on it because you don't, you don't see any danger. And before you know it, there's a crash. That's the way the church is. I recall the church where I grew up, um, uh, Hillcrest Baptist Church in Dallas, and I'll use it. Um, probably shouldn't, but I will. Uh, I used to call it good old Hillcrest, probably the best church in Dallas, Texas. Now, in those days, nobody had rediscovered the soul-winning church. They had the evangelistic church where you preach the gospel and preach folks down the aisle. But you didn't, you didn't have soul winning churches like this church and like churches across America. But it was a good church. Everybody called it good old Hillcrest. But something happened to Hillcrest. And it's only a shadow now of what it used to be. Now what happened? We should have been watching all the time. It was a time of peace. Smooth sailing. No troubles. And that's where the troubles come. I don't care what your institution is, you'd be fixing it all the time. You'd be fixing your marriage all the time. You'd be fixing your school all the time. You'd be fixing your own life all the time. You'd be fixing your church all the time. You'd be fixing your Sunday school class all the time. You'd be fixing your bus route all the time. In Matthew 13, we have the story of the parable of the tares. The Bible says that tares are sown among the wheat. Now, what are tares? Tares are the unstayed people. <clears throat> but a tear looks like wheat. A tear doesn't look like a weed. Though it is a weed, it looks like the wheat. It's so much like the wheat, you can't even tell by the naked eye whether it's wheat or not. And the Bible says that the tares were sown among the wheat. The devil doesn't need to sow any tares in these churches down here on Holman Avenue. They're not having church tonight. He didn't he, he have to fight those churches. They're already gone. I mean, where does the devil sow the tares? Right here in good old First Baptist Church of Hammond. And the Bible says that they're sown while men slept. Didn't say they're sown while men sin. It said they're sown while men slept. Didn't say they're sown while men drink. It said they're sown while men slept. Didn't say they're sown while men curse. It says they're sown while men slept. While men are at ease in Zion, thinking this is the greatest church in the world, I've got the greatest home in the world, I've got the greatest family in the world, I've got the greatest marriage in the world, I've got the greatest school in the world, while we sleep and don't fix it. Because it's not broken, we don't fix it. And because we don't fix it, something goes wrong. And the danger is in the best marriage, the best school, the best church. I'm saying, <laughs> always be fixing it all the time. 
it's the Christian and those institutions who are in the most trouble. The average Christian is a set of honor go rarely falls. One year from tonight, one year from tonight, many of you in this room, many of us in this room, will be useless to God. I'm talking about many people in this room right now, maybe several hundred, will one year from tonight be useless to God, out of church. I'm not talking about, about, uh, about big sin now. I'm talking about backsliding away from God, out of church. Hundreds in this room a year from and I'll guarantee you this, most of them will fall from the top, not from the middle. That means that if you have a good church, you've got to watch it more. Fix it, even if it's not broken. That means if you go to a good college, you've got to watch it more. Fix it, even if it's not broken. That means if you have the happier marriage, you've got to watch it more. Fix it. I say again, it is the best marriage that's in the most trouble. It is the best school that's in the most trouble. It is the best church that's in the most trouble. It is the best institution that's in the most trouble. And it's the best Christian who's in the most trouble. Now why or how? How does this happen? Number one, by the way, let me, let me, let me just parenthesize here. You know already the press is beginning to shoot at Mr. Bush. It would be a wonderful thing if, if all the press could be sent to Iraq and turns the dam loose on them. But they're already shooting at Mr. Mr. Bush. And, and, and now then, America is not as united as she was a few weeks ago. We are in more danger as a country tonight from complacency than we were a few weeks ago in the time of war. Because we knew we had an enemy. But the enemy that will destroy America is not in, in Iraq. The enemy that will destroy America is in America. We become complacent. Everything's fine. Good old United States of America. And while we have done that, Japan has passed us in production, and Germany has probably passed us in production, and we no longer are the leading nation in many areas of the world like we were a long time ago. Now what happened? At ease in Zion. This is America, the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Well, if she stays that way, fix it even though it's not broken. This is the greatest church in the world, Brother John said it a while ago. Okay, let's keep fixing it even though it's not broken. Now, what happens, or how? It is easy to let atmosphere sweep us along. I can tell you people who were out yonder in churches across America. They came to pastor school, and they saw, they said, <coughs> for the first time <coughs> in their lives, what a real New Testament church ought to be. And boy, they said, if I could ever get there, I could make it. I'd be a great Christian if I could ever get there. Now, let me say this. It's not here that makes you a good Christian. It's doing what you hear here tomorrow that makes you a good Christian. It is not the atmosphere of this church. It's not sitting here and watching hundreds of people get saved every Sunday. That's not what makes you a good Christian. What makes you a good Christian is listening to what's preached in this pulpit and going home tomorrow and going to work tomorrow and going out uh, to your activities tomorrow and doing what I preach. You've got to keep your spiritual life up. I don't care where you are. You can, uh, uh, the, the, uh, Lucifer could sin in heaven. You dead sure could fall here in First Baptist Church. While we have folks all over this area who tonight are, are I don't, don't even care for this church. They hate this church. And they don't go to a decent church have no conviction, no standards at all, who came to this church because the college and the church was here and they thought this was utopia. I don't care if it's utopia or not, you can backslide here in First Baptist Church of Hammond. You can backslide in the millennium. You can backslide in the Garden of Eden. You can backslide in heaven, uh, as, as, as Lucifer did. I'm saying you, you will not be a good Christian because you get swept along with the force of a great church like this. So what happens? They come to First Baptist Church, they let down their guard. It's not broken anymore. Now back home, the church is broken. Back home, they fought for soul winning. Back home, they fought for standards. Back home, they fought for convictions. Back home, they fought for old-fashioned preaching. 
Back home they fought for a separate, separated church. But now they come here, and we believe what you believe on salvation. We believe what you believe on separation. We believe what you believe about soul winning. We believe what you believe about preaching. So you sit down, and you say, I don't have to fight. I'm at ease in Zion. And before you know it, the person that did not stumble out yonder where they had to fix it all the time stumbles here because they don't fix it all the time, even though it's not broken. What else? How else does it happen? Because... The object of the devil's attack is the best marriage. The object of the devil's attack is the best church. Tell you what you do. <laughs> Go down to the churches on uh, Holman Road, where the preacher's home watching TV right now. Probably a movie. No, no evening services. I like what Vance Hebner said. So aren't you concerned because these churches... <laughs> don't have church on Sunday night. He said, no, what concerns me is that churches like this do have service on Sunday morning. But you go down there to the services next Sunday morning where they don't believe this book is the Word of God and don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and don't believe in the virgin birth, you won't find the devil down there. He doesn't have any job down there. But you come to First Baptist Church Hammond, you've got little demons running all over this place. Why? Because this is the object of Satan's attack. If you were the devil, what church would you attack? If you were the devil, what ministry would you attack? If you were the devil, what home would you attack? If you were the devil, what school would you attack? I'm saying that the best marriage here is in the most danger. I'm saying the best church is in the most danger. I'm saying the best school is in the most danger. I'm saying the best Christian is in the most danger. And I'll guarantee you, I could take you and show you statistics of it. I could show you proof of it that the nominal schools don't fall. The nominal churches don't fall. It's the great churches that fall. Mr. I guess it's a Mr. Where's a skirt? But Schuler. Roberta Schuler. I'll guarantee you their attendance is not going down. Why? Good night. What, what, why does the devil want to bother that? He's probably a member there. Don't bother that. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I can take you to churches all over America that once were soul-winning hotbeds for evangelism and churches that have gone down to almost nothing. You know why? Because they got to the place where they said, good old Hillcrest, good old First Baptist, and we didn't keep fixing things that before they... The best time to fix something is before it breaks. And they did not guard it all the time. And what happened was, they, they, the atmosphere uh, was so wonderful that, that before you knew it, the churches fell. But I'm saying that the average churches don't fall as much as the great churches do. Because the great churches are more the object of Satan's attack. Back in the days of the Texas War of Independence, we were outnumbered. Doesn't matter if Texans are outnumbered. Doesn't matter. We're outnumbered. And you know what they said? They said to the men in the ranks, <coughs> they said, we cannot win this war. Are you listening? We cannot win this war, they said, shooting the common soldier. They said the way to win this war, shoot at the ones who have the brass buttons. Shoot at the ones who have the brass buttons. So the devil says shoot at the home that has the brass buttons. Shoot at the marriage that has the brass buttons. Shoot at the college. Listen, if Howells Anderson College stays what she ought to be, it'll be because we work as hard to keep it what it ought to be as we would to get it back. We found it was gone. Fix it while it's not broken. Fix it before it breaks. Somebody's got to be a seer. Somebody's got to be a prophet. Somebody's got to... And by the way, we've got to watch it all the time. All the time. Not only that, Listen carefully to this. There's something that happens to Christian people who grow in grace. We rise to a certain place to where we think we are above that. That's what Peter said. Jesus said, one of you <coughs> will deny me three times before the cock crows. And Peter said, well, one thing, Lord, you sure can depend on me. 
Now, it may be old John. He never has talked much anyhow. It may be old James and John. They want the best seats in the house. It may be Thomas. He's always an outer. But you sure can count on me. He, he was above that. What he should have been doing is fixing it before it broke. We think we get above it. Churches think they get above it. Colleges think they get above it. Christians think they get above it. Listen to me. Marriages think they get above it. I won't tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll get that in a minute. Now, what can we do? What can we do? In the first place, in your own personal life, fix it all the time. Don't wait to get bachelor to read the Bible. Somebody said, I don't think all those folks ought to come down to the altar all the time. I, I know. That's why you said that. What you ought to do is come down to the altar when you're, when you're about to do something instead of after you've done it. When you see the slightest symptom, the slightest weakness, the slightest, slightest temptation, fix it before it breaks. In your personal life, don't wait to pray till you're backslidden. Pray to keep from backsliding. Don't, um, don't. And, and by the way, every job you've got, do it well. Do it well. I told the deacons last night, the biggest problem we have at First Baptist Church, and any church has it, and we have it too, the biggest problem is we set a rule or make a rule, and, 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 and somehow there, we, we, we have the idea if we're not reminded every three months that rule is supposed to be enforced, we drop it. Now you listen to me. The best way in the world for Howells Anderson College to always stay like she is now is for you to keep that little area that God has given you. And you fix it before it breaks. And you keep on fixing and keep on fixing and keep on fixing. And the same thing's true in your life. Fix it before when, when, it, when it's not broken. Always predict when it's getting weak. Replace the light bulb before it burns out. Replace the tube in the radio about right before it burns out. I'm saying always be fixing it even though it's not broken. Number two, in your marriage. Don't take your mate for, mate for granted. Don't take your mate for granted. How many women, instead of a while ago, how many women who said this? I don't know. I didn't know anything was wrong. But the problem was none of you weren't fixing it. Well, I thought we had the ideal marriage. Now, the first place, you all realize there's no ideal marriage, which means you ought to be fixing it all the time. In the church, I watch this church constantly. I need you to help me. I need you in your own little area of service. I, if, for example, in the matter of our girls wearing culottes, the rule has been for the 31, 32 years almost I've been pastor of this church. In the activities of this church, a culotte is not a, a culottes are not culottes unless you can't tell they're culottes. If you can tell they're culottes, they're not culottes here. Now, I need you to enforce that. I need every Sunday school teacher in this room to enforce that. What happens is you don't fix it because it's not broken. And before you know it, they're gauchos instead of culottes. Well, you say, what's wrong with gauchos? I'm not saying anything's wrong with gauchos, but gauchos are closer to shorts than culottes are. And I want to stay as far away from shorts as I can. Now, what I'm trying to say is I need you to help me there. I need every Sunday school teacher. I need the youth department and the high school and the junior high school and the grade school and the college and every activity, every person in charge of activities. I need you to help me see to it that before it breaks, we fix it. Take the matter of boys' hair. We've, we're sliding some on boys' hair in our schools and in our, in our, in our church. Now, I want to say, East of the House, what's wrong with a the, with the, with the head that's not tapered? What's wrong with a head that is tapered? I'm not trying to keep you out of sin. I'm trying to keep you a long ways from sin. When it comes to the First Baptist Church, may I have this mic, please? Hey, PA man. I, when I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying here that that let's, 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 let's don't, this is sin. Let's be careful. Let's don't go into sin. I'm saying get way over here. I'm say, I love that illustration. I love that story about that little girl who came to me at Howells Edison College. She came to my office. She was totally, totally. Uh, uh, ashamed. And she said, Brother Howes, I'm about to break your heart. And I, 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 I said, w w what happened? She said, I'm a fallen woman. I'm a fallen woman. 
And I said, oh, I can't believe that you would. She said, I didn't either, but I'm a fallen woman. I said, where did it happen? She said, in the hallway at Howells Anderson College. Oh, my soul, I can't believe we've gone that far. Oh, I said, honey, how could you have done it there in the hallway of Howells Anderson College? She said, I did. I'm a fallen woman. I said, what did you do? She said, I held a boy's hand. I almost shouted. And I said, praise God that the rules of Hiles Anderson College are several steps from sin. I mean, praise God that you can fall and not go into sin at Hiles Anderson College. You say, is it a, a sin to hold a girl's hand? I'm not saying it's a sin, but it's a crime. There are several steps between our haircuts and sin. But bless God, if we, if we go one step from where we are, we still haven't gone into sin. And the farther we can keep from sin, the better off we are. I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, I, I know, I, I'm, I'm no kid. I'm, I'm, I'm an old college. I've been around a while. I've preached in all the Christian colleges, the ones that have gone, the ones that haven't gone. I've preached in practically every great Christian college or little Christian college. In this nation, the last generation, I watched them go down and down and down, and they never go from up here into sin. They go first to hand holding, then they go to allowing you to embrace, then they go to allowing you to date by yourselves in cars alone, and before you know it, they're gone. I'm saying that the, they don't—they don't go in one step. They go because we don't fix it when it's not broken. That's why I watch it, watch it constantly. Keep my eyes on it all the time. Got to watch it all the time. By the way, don't be the one that causes the trouble. You stay in your area and try to keep your area policed. I said again, the happiest married people in this room tonight are in the most trouble. <laughs> but that's released a lot of you. <laughs> I saw one guy look at his wife and said, We ain't in no trouble, baby. <laughs> first Baptist Church is in more trouble than the First Presbyterian Church is. Which means we've got to be fixing it all the time. All the time. In your life, the higher you get, the more likely you are to fall. A little child fell. I, I was out east and picked up a local newspaper. A little child fell from, I think, about the 12th floor in an apartment building and killed the child. If that same child had fallen from the same type balcony from the first floor, he wouldn't have been hurt. If he had fallen on the second floor, he wouldn't have been killed. It was the twelfth floor. The higher you are, the more the danger. And that's why you've got to be, in your personal life, you've got to be fixing it all the time. I, again, I shouldn't say this, but good night. If you're saying things you shouldn't say for 44 years, go ahead and say it. Back in the days when the Gideons, all they used was the King James Bible. And uh, I, I, I had some respect for the Gideon's organization. I haven't got any respect for any organization that puts out a Bible other than the King James Bible. Whether it's the American Bible Society or whatever it is. But I'm saying that, that, that I, I wondered about something anyway. Over in the front it would say something like this. If you are discouraged, read this verse. If you are lonely, read this verse. If you're about to commit suicide, read this verse. Everything was corrective. Everything was corrective. What's wrong with preventive maintenance? 
What's wrong with getting your spiritual oil changed every few thousand miles? What's wrong with getting your spiritual engine tuned up every few thousand miles? What's wrong with fixing it? That's, what, that, that's the way you keep a car up. You don't look down one day and see that, that light there flashing and say, well, out of oil. You're out of something else, too. You're out of rods. That's not the time. Time to do it is before it gets anywhere near danger. You change the oil. That's the time to do it. That's the time to fix anything before it breaks. I'm talking to folks tonight in this room. Every time you get a little backslidden, you come trotting down. And I'm not against that. You ought to. If you're away from God, you ought to get right with God. But hey, listen. Why don't we come trot down this aisle to prevent any maintenance? Why don't we come trot down this aisle before we get backslidden? Well, I'm away from God. Better get back in the Bible. Won't you get back in the? Won't you stay in the Bible before you get away from God? Well, I'm away from God. Got to go back on my knees and pray. Why don't you pray when you before you get away from God? I'll say it again. I'm finished. The finest Christians in this room are in the most danger of falling. These teenagers that are looking at each other right now, misbehaving, writing notes, looking at each other like these two girls back here behind Miss Fry. They wouldn't know me if you saw me on the street tomorrow morning. They're not going to fall. You can't fall if you ain't up. But I'll tell you who's in danger of falling. These precious girls that sang the trio a while ago. The devil liked to have them. Of all the groups that sang in pastor school, Brother Randy Taylor, who's conducting a, a big conference in Dallas called God Save America Rally, he chose these high school girls of ours, of all the groups, to come and sing in their meeting, big meeting down in, in Dallas. Now, that's the ones the devil wants. The devil doesn't want you folks don't pay attention. You won't pay attention to him either. It's the best kid in the most danger. It's the best marriage in the most trouble. It's the best church in the most trouble. It's the best school in the most trouble. You check my preaching through the years. Young lady back there, I've already called you down. Now look at me while I'm preaching. I'm sick of it. Look at me. Hey! All in the service, you've been misbehaving. Look up here. If you go to college, you won't be going tomorrow if you don't pay attention to the rest of this sermon. My life is built and has been for 32 years trying to fix this thing here before it breaks. That's my life. That's one of the things I fear. One of these days, I'm going to be too old a pastor here. I'm going to go on to heaven one of these days, 35, 40 years from now. But, but I'm simply saying, I fear. i got some things I want to say, but I'll say this, and I, I promise you I'll close. But I don't know when I'll close, but I promise you I will close. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. I was at a church a couple years ago where I've been for many years, every year for many years. Pastor's a good man, one of the finest men I know, one of the best gentlemen I know, one of the most uh, honest men I know. He took a church running a couple of 300 in Sunday school and built it in about 10 years, running 1,800. Now for the last 10 years, it's been around 18, 17, 16, 15, between 15 and 1,800 the last 10 years. And I asked him when I was with him last time, I said, what are you accounting for? How do you account for that? How do you account for the fact that for the first 10 years you grew from 318 and now you haven't grown any for the last 10 years? And he looked at me and said, I don't want it like I did then. I don't want it. He said, I must confess it. I just don't want it like I wanted it then. That's what happens. But see, I want it as much now as I wanted 32 years ago. And I want, and, 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 I'm, I, and I fear for the, for the fact that, that someday somebody will be here behind this pulpit that, that won't keep his hand on everything. Won't keep fixing things before they break. Watching things. When something gets just a tad weak, fix it before it breaks. And what happens? A church becomes a little society. Not sinful. A little society. 
study the Bible, have their socials and banquets, preach the gospel and get a few people saved this Sunday enough to make us say of our conscience. And before we know it, we fall. Because it's the best church that's in most trouble. And the best college that's in the most trouble. And the best Christian that's in the most trouble. And the best marriage that's in the most trouble. Quick, quick, quick. Fix it before it breaks. Our Heavenly Father. Date by yourselves in cars alone. And before you know it, they're gone. I'm saying that the, they, don't, they don't go in one step. They go because we don't fix it when it's not broken. That's why I watch it, watch it constantly. Keep my eyes on it all the time. Got to watch it all the time. By the way, don't be the one that causes the trouble. You stay in your area and try to keep your area policed. I said again, the happiest married people in this room tonight are in the most trouble. But that's relieved a lot of you. <laughs> I saw one guy look at his wife and said, We ain't no trouble, baby. <laughs> first Baptist Church is in more trouble than the First Presbyterian Church is. Which means we've got to be fixing it all the time. All the time. In your life, the higher you get, the more likely you are to fall. A little child fell. I, I was out east and picked up a local newspaper. A little child fell from, I think, about the 12th floor in an apartment building and killed the child. If that same child had fallen from the same type balcony, from the first floor, he wouldn't have been hurt. If he had fallen on the second floor, he wouldn't have been killed. It was the twelfth floor. The higher you are, the more the danger. And that's why you've got to be, in your personal life, you've got to be fixing it all the time. I, again, I shouldn't say this, but good night. If you're saying things you shouldn't say for 44 years, go ahead and say it. Back in the days when the Gideons, all they used was the King James Bible. And uh, I, I, I had some respect for the Gideons organization. I haven't got any respect for any organization that puts out a Bible other than the King James Bible. Whether it's American Bible Society or whatever it is. But I'm saying that, that, that I, I wondered about something anyway. Over in the front it would say something like this. If you are discouraged, read this verse. If you are lonely, read this verse. If you're about to commit suicide, read this verse. Everything was corrective. Everything was corrective. What's wrong with preventive maintenance? What's wrong with getting your spiritual oil changed every few thousand miles? What's wrong with getting your spiritual engine tuned up every few thousand miles? What's wrong with fixing?